Meet Ark, who is an overpowered skeleton knight trying to live a normal life as a mercenary in your typical medieval fantasy world. But before he was a fantasy-obsessed skeleton in mythical grade armor, he was a regular gamer and wrestling fan on Earth, whose life was so boring that the writer did not even bother to show it. So, when he found himself as his game character in a strange world, he checked out his wide range of skills before seeing his face in a river, only to find that he was a skeleton like the character he created. After recovering from the shock, he went to the nearest town and realized that he could get hungry even as a skeleton. Therefore, he registered at the mercenary guild to get a license and earn money, and started his rather ordinary life. One day, while returning from hunting two boars and an orc, he finds a group of bandits attacking the caravan of a young noble girl. The bandits have killed all her guards and are now trying to assault her, but he teleports behind their boss and, with one swing of his sword, kills him and two others. The other thugs are afraid and run away, but he uses a long-range attack called the Wyvern Slash and saves them the trouble of going to jail by sending them to hell. Despite having great power, Ark does not want to reveal his truth to the world as it could put him in danger, so he decides to keep a low profile and accepts his first quest to act as a girl's guard while she picks medicinal herbs. The girl is initially overwhelmed by her escort, thinking it was like a man working as a cab driver in a Lamborghini but soon becomes comfortable and leads him to the forest, teaching him about medicinal plants along the way. Ark notices an injured nine-tail fox pup in the bushes who is quite aggressive initially, but as our hero catches her and heals her injury using magic, she decides to become his pet, whom he names Panta. They finally reach the deepest part of the forest, and from a cliff, they see a single white cherry blossom tree in full bloom. The girl wants to collect its flowers, but as she excitedly climbs down and runs towards the tree, Ark and Ponta notice a monster. It is Godzilla's cousin Godzilla, who is a six-legged basilisk, and finding a helpless prey before him, he tries to stomp on her and make her into minced meat. But Ark uses his short-range teleportation skill, Dimension Walk, to save her. Godzilla uses Poison Breath and Ark teleports again, while thinking of the range of attacks the monster has and decides that it will be best to face it in close combat. He blocks the claw attacks of Godzilla, but then it switches to using its long tongue, and I think this monster keeps its girlfriend quite happy. Ark keeps on dodging all its attacks, so Godzilla gets impatient and charges his ultimate attack and launches a petrification wave. While all living things in the range of the attack turn to stone, Ark uses his holy shield, which can nullify any status effects, to save himself and the girl. But now that Todzilla is even more furious and using more arms to fight him, the knight is being pressed back. To end the battle quickly, Ark uses a high-level skill called Judgment and creates a magic circle under the basilisk. And then he summons a giant lightning sword from the magic circle, finishing Todzilla in just one hit. The girl is impressed and thinks that the knight will be celebrated as a hero. But since Ark wants to keep a low profile, he asks her to keep it a secret. He also notices a red and black ring on one foot of Todzilla, which shatters seconds after it dies. As they are returning to the village, Ark spots a giant boar and decides to treat the village to some tasty meat tonight. He hunts and takes the boar to the village and tells them to give its leather skin to the girl, and the meat is for everyone. That alone is enough to make him a local hero, but as he is about to leave the village, the girl's little sister rewards him with a flower tiara. So when Ark goes back to his room at the inn and looks at his reward, he realizes that there is more to life than just saving his own secret, and for the people who need his help, he will work harder from tomorrow on. Ark takes on the quest of hunting bandits after the life-changing first quest and chases a group of thieves and kidnappers in their own hideout, and after he takes them down, he claims to find their treasure stash too. There are two open cages with food bowls in front of them, which confuse him, but he decides not to pay much attention to things that are not his business. As he comes out of the cave with his gold, a hooded girl launches a surprise attack on him. He wonders if the attacker was another bandit, but her sword skills were very good, and she was almost as fast as him. In the tussle, Ark notices her pointed ears and remembers that she was the elf girl he saw in the market when he was roaming around the city the other day. The girl Arian is an elf warrior who is trying her best to protect her people and save the elf children that have been kidnapped by greedy humans, and she mistakes Ark as one of them. She curses him, and as he tries to explain, she does not even listen, but as soon as she sees Ponta, she drops her guard and asks him why there was a spirit creature with a bandit. Ark thought that she just liked puppies, 
but the elf girl tells him that the pup with him was actually one of the spirit creatures, who were known to be quite cautious and never liked bad people. So if the pup was so close to him, it meant he was a decent person, and Arian apologizes to him. She tells him the story of how some bandits kidnapped elves to sell them as slaves, and Ark realizes what the cages inside the cave were for. She wants to check out the cave, and he tells her that she will find nothing there. He offers to help her on her quest, but she tells him to stay out of their business and leaves without even exchanging names. But the gamer inside Ark does not plan to give up because he knows this is an event where he will help a beautiful girl and recruit her into his party. The next day, he uses Dimension Walk to teleport himself into the dense forest where the elves were said to live, and there he hears some human voices. A group of bandits were kidnapping elf kids, and their leader was a spoiled brat named Udalan. They had captured four elves, and when one of them stared at Udalan, he tormented her, making her beg and then stabbing her. Ark had seen enough of it, and he is furious that the bandits were treating elves as less than humans. But before he can go in to rescue the children, Arian suddenly leaps at the humans out of nowhere and kills two of them in one strike. One bandit tells Udalan that she was a dark elf, and if they catch her, she might fetch a high price, so he orders his men to capture her. As they walk towards her with a creepy grin, she hacks and slashes her way through them. She defeats most of the bandits, but then Udalan shouts at her to not move if she wants the children to live. Seeing that he was holding the children hostage, Arian could only curse him, but she was helpless as the bandits tried to molest her. It is time for the hero to show up, and Ark suddenly appears behind Udalan, tossing him away with a move he learned from WWE and slamming him into a tree. Arian is no longer helpless and kills the rest of the bandits with twice the rage. She tries to free the kids, but the door is locked, and as Ark offers to help her, she is still arrogant. But he says that the safety of the children was more important than this being the elves' personal problem, and he snaps the lock with his bare hands. The kids are afraid of him and run to Arian, and as she comforts them, she sees that they were made to wear Mana Eater collars to stop them from using their spirit magic. Arian realizes this is why no one could escape, but she herself cannot break the collar right now. Ark uses his anti-curse spell and takes the collars off the injured girl, even healing her. Arian is shocked, and she realizes that no normal knight could have such a wide range of skills. While she is busy thinking, Ark has freed all the children, and they are quite friendly with him now. The elf girl then summons a bird called the Whispering Fowl, which acts as a messenger pigeon and voice recorder, and sends a message about the rescued children, asking someone to come and escort them back to the village. Soon, two elven guards come, and they take the kids to safety, and Ark tells them that if they are ever in trouble, he will save them again. Arian calls him a weird person, but in a good way. She says that he was the first decent human she met who did not discriminate against the elves, and on top of that, he could use so many types of magic, including the legendary teleportation magic. They both introduce themselves properly, and the elf girl thanks him for helping her and saving the kids. Then someone sends the voicemail bird to her, and as it speaks, Ark is stunned. The message is from another elf, who tells Arian that he has found the location of the kidnapped children, and he calls her to join him in the city and help with the rescue operation. She thinks for a while and then asks Ark if she could hire him as a mercenary right away. She says that she has never trusted a non-elf before, but he would take a chance with her, and Ark quickly accepts the deal. He uses his long-range teleportation spell Gate to move to a cliff, and the elf thinks this ability will be most helpful in their mission. From there, they walk to the city, where they wait in a dark alley for the elf named Danka who had called them there. Danka is a serious, no-nonsense guy with scary eyes and a very silent voice, and contrary to his name, he does not make dank memes. His cold gaze scares Ark even as Arian introduces them, and he doesn't even pay him any attention. He feels left out even as they go to a restaurant to talk more about their plan, where Ark learns that both the elves shared the last name Maple, which was the name of their city in the Great Canada Forest. Is ice hockey the national sport of elves? Arian asks him to eat, but he declines the offer, because if he showed them his face, they would attack him even before he even gets a chance to explain himself. But Donka does not even bother to talk with Ark. He focuses on the food, acting like a critic, and only when he sees Ponta does he trust the knight a little bit. He then says that he found the location of the children, and they plan to make their move at night. Since they have to wait until then, Ark says he will return after finishing his chores. 
he goes and caches in whatever he found during the battle with the bandits. And before joining the elves, he decides to eat. He buys his favorite things and sits on a dirty street to eat, which is still more hygienic than most of your rooms, where you spend 90% of your time. The group reaches the location at night, but they have not noticed that a ninja is closely following them. They find some guards at the gate, and Arian asks Ark to teleport them outside the windows on the first floor. He uses Dimension Walk to bring them there when they were expecting him to use Gate, and Arian says that they will sneak in through the window. She tries to go in through the tight space, but there are some moments where being so thick is a disadvantage. So she gets stuck in the hole, as she somehow squeezes herself in, Ark and Danka teleport inside using Dimension Walk, and she is quite embarrassed now. They silently move down and open a room to see a bunch of dead people there who had been assassinated quite recently. There was someone else inside the building, and to hurry up, the group decides to split up and search for the elves. Ark moves using dimension walking and peeks through keyholes so that he can teleport inside the rooms after he can see them. He finds another room full of dead people, and then suddenly someone throws ninja knives at him. He deflects them, and a small ninja attacks him with quick footwork and swift strikes, but he blocks all the attacks. Ark is amazed to see a ninja, and on top of that, she had cat ears and a tail and he thanks his luck for this day. The ninja girl is shocked to hear that the knight knows about ninjas, and then she sees Ponta and apologizes for attacking someone who had been acknowledged by a spirit creature. She guesses that Ark was here to find the kidnapped elves and tells him that they were in the basement, and she gives him a bunch of papers containing helpful information. She was here for something else but could not find it, so she was leaving quietly after killing some bandits. Before leaving, she tells Ark that there were two elves in the Lord's Mansion too, and then hops away over the roofs. Ark thinks that having Ponta by his side was the best thing that happened in this universe, and he thinks that they really were friends with another type of benefit. Then he opens the documents and is shocked to read that they are contracts to buy elves. He shows them to his companions, and they are also shocked to see them and to learn that Lord Dinto, the ruler of this area, was leading the kidnapping gang. Ark tells them what he learned from the ninja, but keeps her identity hidden and takes the credit, saying he interrogated someone. The group is thinking about sneaking to the basement when the bandits find them, and they have no choice but to fight their way out. Arian uses her special move, the fire blade, and in one attack turns the bandits into coal. With that, they rush to the basement, where scared elf girls are trembling in fear, as they hear the loud thuds and booms outside. Ark and his elf comrades come in and he opens the prison gates by bending them like they were made of clay. Then he teleports everyone out to another cliff because this world has more cliffs than people. Ark removes the Mana Eater collars from the girls and they get emotional as they thank him. Danka also finally trusts him and leaves rescuing the two remaining elves to him and Arian while he takes the children back with him to the village. The Lord's Mansion is in sight and Ark uses Dimension Move to teleport him and Arian over to it. She asks him to go to the highest place because the Lord must have his room there. But as soon as they land there, they run into guards who ask them to stop and surrender. Ark uses Wyvern Slash and breaks the warning bell in the tower, creating enough smoke and sound to ruin their plan of sneaking in. The guards panic as they try to find the intruders, but Ark successfully hides among the night statues, and they cannot find him. These guys are even more blind than Dora the Explorer. A servant runs to Lord Dinto, Eudelon's dad, who is about to have a naughty time with the elves, telling him that two monsters have invaded the mansion. That is the last thing he says as the door behind him is blasted by Ark and Arian, who make their dramatic entry. Eudelon freaks out upon seeing them and tries to run away by crawling, as Dinto tries to confront the trespassers, but Arian kicks him at a man's weakest point and then saves the girls. Meanwhile, Ark Wall slams Eudelon, who is so terrified that he passes out, but our hero unlocks a hidden room by breaking the wall. He tells Arian to take a look at it too, but she is too busy practicing her soccer skills with the Lord's butt. She tells Ark about the peace treaty between humans and elves, and Dinto broke it first, so he deserved to get the punishment. She even calls the two elf girls to take out their rage on the man, and I think Dinto got neutered like my dog. As some soldiers come to rescue their Lord, Ark asks Arian to keep them busy while he checks out the hidden room. She uses her flame sword, beats all the soldiers, and tells the elf girls to flee to safety. She then goes to the hidden room to find Ark collecting gold bricks, and before she can lecture him about how stealing is bad, he has a plan to convince her. He says that it takes a lot of money to build any organization, 
and if the humans try to restart their kidnapping gang, they won't be able to do it quickly if they have no funds. Aryan believes him and even compliments his planning abilities. Suddenly, explosions shake the entire mansion, and Ark and Aryan quickly leave with the money as the building gets destroyed. Neither of them did it, and Ark thinks that it must be the Beast Girl Ninja. The deal with Aryan is done, and she offers him money and feels that it is nothing compared to the treasure he just stole. But like a true hustler, Ark does not hesitate to take a dollar when he already has a million. Then she asks him if he has no plans, he can come with her to the Land of Elves. Many of their people were still suffering at the hands of humans, and she could use his help to save them. Ark really wants to go and live out a life full of fantasy, but acts doubtful, asking if the elves will accept an outsider. Arian replies that she will try her best to make sure he gets the permission of the elders, but Ark says that he cannot take off his armor even if they need it for verification. She asks him his reasons, and he builds up the tension, saying she might see him as a monster if he takes off the helmet, and when she promises not to think anything, he reveals to her that he is a skeleton. Arian is shocked and asks what happened to his face, but Ark can't tell her about being a game character in another world, so he just says that he found himself like this one day. He recites the backstory of his game character. He was a holy knight who was cursed and now had to travel the land to find a solution for this curse. Arian is still surprised, but she can confirm that Ark is not an undead because then his spirit would have been corrupted and he could not use healing or light magic. Neither would Ponta be as close to him as she is now, and the elf warrior says that she will accept him as he is. The elves will keep his secret safe, and the elder may have some clues if his problem was really because of a curse. Ark accepts her offer, and they make a deal to travel together. She takes him to her city through dense forests, and the overexcited Ark tries to use dimensional walk and falls down another cliff near a river. They take their evening rest there, and Arian sends a voicemail to tell her people that she is returning with a guest. She is still hungry, so Ark goes to hunt some more, and as he returns, he finds the otherwise serious elf girl cuddling with Ponta, and he makes sure to tease her about it. After a couple of days, they reach the elf city, and seeing the giant iron gate, Ark can only marvel at it. Arian asks for the gate to be opened, and Ark is impressed by the fantasy element of the heavy iron gate being lifted. She goes inside and tells him to wait here till she gets the elder's permission. Ark checks the tall wooden fence around the town and thinks that since elves live a long life, it must also be quite old. It seems like elves are not slow only when it comes to aging. Orion is taking too long to get permission, and Ark plays around with Ponta, trains his swordsmanship, exercises, and even gets a small power nap before she returns. Thankfully, she has gotten permission and calls him in, and the knight finds that the elf town looked like a farming village, but the giant pod-like houses looked like they had been made by a designer. In the center of the town was a giant tree, which was the house and office of the town elder. Arian takes Ark to the elder Dillion and his wife, Glennies, who welcome him warmly and thank him for taking care of their daughter. Only now does he learn that Arian was the elder's daughter, and she never told him anything about it. Glennies says that she was just 170 years old, when in fact she was over 240, and this habit annoys Arian. Ark is shocked to confirm that the elves really lived quite long because she did not look older than 30. The elder thanks Ark for helping the elves, but then he turns to his daughter and asks him why she attacked a noble's house when their mission was to only retrieve the kidnapped elves. She cannot give him a proper answer, but Ark intervenes and explains the details of what happened over tea. Elder Dillion says that he will report this to the convention of elf elders tomorrow and will also show them the sales contracts for elf slaves that Ark found. Now that they are done talking business, Glennies brings food, and as everyone starts eating, Ark is nervous about what to do. Arian tells him not to worry about anything, and Dillion adds that he has heard everything about his condition, and that all three of his family members would keep his secret. Ark is convinced, and he hesitantly takes off his helmet before eating with someone else for the first time in weeks. The next morning, he wakes up in a comfy bed without his armor, and Ponta is using his empty chest as a good resting place. As Ark goes out, he learns from the elders that Dillion and Arian had already left to attend the convention of elders. Just behind their house was the transport circle to the elven capital city, and it was just a giant wooden stump with a magic crystal on the side, and it took several elf wizards to teleport someone. Dillion and Arian arrive in the capital city, which is bustling with activity, and they head straight to the headquarters, where all the other elders have gathered. 
The elected chief of all elders asks Dillian about what he found out about the recent kidnappings, and he gives him a detailed report. The elders are horrified upon learning the truth, and they think that it was a justifiable cause to go to war against humans just like they did 600 years ago. But no human remembered the war clearly now, as what was just one generation for elves was a long history for them. After that war, they had made a pact to not harm each other, and now humans had broken it, but making any decision in a hurry was not a good idea. One of the elders suggests sending a complaint to the Rodan Kingdom, with whom they made the pact, but the warrior elder says that they do not need to explain themselves to any humans. On top of that, they may use legal tricks to summon those who are saving the kidnapped children and punish them for attacking a noble's house. The chief of elders also agrees with this, and he orders the rescue operations for kidnapped elves to be continued with increased caution, and they will also keep an eye on the activities of humans. As Arian and her dad return from the meeting, she feels bad about her reckless actions that complicated their position, but Dillian assures her that she did the right thing to save their people. Then they start talking about other things, and Arian learns that her combat-obsessed elder sister is going to marry soon. She is shocked on hearing this and cannot even picture her sister with a man when Evelyn, the sister she was talking about, suddenly tackles her, starts cuddling with her, and ignores her dad. After she has had her share of cuddling, Evelyn says she is proud of Arian for saving so many elves. Hearing these words doesn't make Arian feel better because her sister was one of the best warriors of the elves, and Arian suffered from an inferiority complex by comparing herself to a genius. So she changes the topic and asks her about her marriage, and Evelyn asks her sister if she likes someone. She says that there is no man in her life, but then blushes thinking about Ark, and her sister teases her that if someone wants to marry her, he needs to be stronger than her. Arian asks her to just say that she does not want her to marry in this life, and Evelyn has a good laugh. It seems that the man she has her eyes on is not going to have an easy time beating her sister. As Ark takes a tour of the village, where everyone is suspicious of him and only the girls he saved are his friends, Glennies asks him to spar with her for a bit. They face each other with practice swords, and Ark wonders if the housewife will be alright fighting him, but she says she taught Arian her sword skills. Also, she was a dark elf who were blessed with wonderful physical abilities and felt the need to test out anyone who they found strong and she so wants to see if her daughter's companion is strong enough to protect her. Ark accepts her reasons, and the sparring starts, with Glennies making the first move. She overwhelms Ark with her fast attacks from the front and then appears behind him to trip him. He falls to the ground, and she points her blade towards him, saying that his movements were those of an amateur and giving him tips and tricks to improve. She tells him to get up for round two, and Ark is excited to learn some actual combat skills from an expert. The cheerful and harmless-looking housewife beats him 100 times in the most humbling manner, but he still gets up and faces her. At last, he thinks he found an opportunity to surprise her using Dimension Walk, but even though he gets behind her back, she is quick enough to take him down without any difficulty. But even after being so skilled, she is just a housewife now and begins worrying about what to cook for dinner as she leaves Ark lying in the dust where he says that high stats are not everything and real battle experience is the most valuable of all things. Once he gets back home, he learns that the elves have a bath in their house, and he really wants to get in it. He takes Ponta with him, washes her, and dips himself in the water for a bone-rattling pleasure. Since baths were rare and a luxury item in this world, this was his first time getting in one here, and his bones felt quite good. As he is enjoying his bath time with his pet, the unsuspecting Arian has also returned home, and she heads into the bath without confirming if anyone was there. And conveniently, they have no door in the bathrooms because who cares about privacy? She is shocked to see a skeleton in her bathtub, and does not listen to Ark as he tries to tell her that it was him, and blasts him away. At the dinner table, both of them are embarrassed because the other saw them without clothes, but it should not matter to Ark as he has nothing to hide. Then Dillian comes and starts talking with Ark about what the elders decided. They wanted to hire him to assist Arian in rescuing the kidnapped elves. Also, since they did not have much money to pay someone as rich as him, they decided to trade in some precious information that could help him break his curse. Dillian tells him that there was a hot spring near the Lord's Crown that was said to break all the curses of the people taking a dip in it. Ark asks him what the Lord's Crown was and the elf recites a long story of how there were many types of dragon-like creatures in the world, and the strongest of them were the dragon lords. 
The Lord's Crown was a rare type of great tree that grew wherever a dragon lord made its home, and a large variety of spirits lived in and around it, giving its leaves and fruits miraculous abilities. But it was also a very risky place to enter, as if anyone disturbed the spirits, they would awaken the rage of the dragon lord. Arian says that entering the Lord's Crown is dangerous for humans, but elves can manage to get permission from the spirits to enter it, and they can arrange it for Ark too. Dililan asks if the information was good enough for a payment, and Ark replies that it was more than enough. But as he lies in bed, he wonders if he was even cursed at all. The story he told everyone was the random character information he put in because it was a role-playing game, but he wonders if it was really true. Then he thinks that if it was a curse, he could purify himself using his anti-curse spell, which was effective against mid-rank curses too. He knew more powerful spells too, but they damaged undead, and he did not want to take any risks. So Ark decides to try out anti-curse on his hand, and surprisingly, the spell works and his hand turns into a human hand. He is shocked and exclaims loudly, but the effect vanishes in five seconds, and his hand returns to being a bone. Ark tries again and again because he badly needs his right hand at night, and after casting the spell all night and having the same result, he is tired. The next day, he and Arian set out for the capital of the Rodan Kingdom early in the morning to find the people whose names were mentioned in the elf selling contracts. He can only think of the last night, and he has confirmed that he was a skeleton because of a curse that keeps on returning like a toxic X, no matter how many times he purifies it. As soon as they get out of the woods, Ark is attacked by giant dragonfly monsters near a lake, and he runs away terrified. Arian saves him and takes him to a restaurant, where they discuss their plan for the next day. She tells him that the usual way to reach the capital was to take a carriage around the forest, but they should just cross the forest to reach it faster. A waitress is listening to them, and she tells them not to go through the forest as it is dangerous because of a pack of monsters called the Haunted Wolves. They had appeared in the area only recently, but they were attacking people, and the soldiers had done nothing to save them. Arian gets lost in thought as soon as she hears about the haunted wolves, but then she says that they were not a problem for them. So they go through the forest, and Ark asks her why she was so concerned after learning about the haunted wolves. Arian tells him that the tail fur of the haunted wolves was used in bridal veils in elven tradition, and it was considered the best gift one could give a bride to be. And since her sister's wedding is near, she wants to gift it to her. The wolves also seem to be eager to have their tails cut off, and suddenly attack them from all sides. Ark slashes one wolf, who vanishes like my self-esteem whenever I see more than four people looking at me. He realizes that the wolves were an illusion, and even though they attack him from all sides, it is not possible to tell if any of them is real. He is getting overwhelmed by their numbers when he remembers that the haunted wolves were intelligent creatures that attacked in packs, and their common tactic to fight stronger opponents was using illusionary clones under their intelligent boss who led them to victory. But while Ark is struggling, Arian is in control of the situation. As a bunch of wolves attack her, she uses a fireball to shoot an illusion down, and as they jump on her after that, she uses earth spikes, getting one real wolf among all the illusions. Ark is again reminded that he has no battle experience despite having such high stats that the wolves biting him don't even make a dent in his armor. Since he cannot fight like Arian, he decides to take on the boss to end the battle quickly. The boss is watching them from a cliff, and if you have some spare time, you can count how many cliffs they have here. Ark uses Dimension Walk to sneak behind him, and as he attacks the wolf boss, he jumps up to dodge his attack. Ark spots the same black and red ring on the boss's leg like the one he saw on Toadzilla, so he decides to test out a theory by becoming still and letting the boss attack him from behind. As soon as the wolf does that, Ark uses a fire attack through his cloak and then swings his sword, only to slash the ring on its leg. As soon as the ring is broken, the boss comes back to his senses. He howls and calls back his pack, and they rush home. Arian climbs up to see what is happening, and she arrives just in time to see the ring disappear. She is shocked, but Ark understands what is going on. He tells her about Toadzilla, who was wearing the same ring, and there has to be more to this than monsters becoming interested in fashion. The monsters were coming to areas that they did not belong in and attacking people, and it was probably because of the rings. Leaving the talk about rings aside, Arian asks Ark to wait for a moment as she collects the tail fur from the wolves she has slain for her sister's gift. Ark is waiting for Arian to finish her job of skinning the wolves when Ponta notices something and runs away. 
Ark follows him and tells Arian to wait here as he chases the fox through the forest. A carriage is passing through the road around the forest, and inside is the princess of the Roden Kingdom, Yuriana, who is traveling on a diplomatic mission to meet the elves about the recent kidnappings. She is sure that her elder brother Dakers was involved in the slave trade, and he was also being backed by the Eastern Holy Empire. On the other side, her eldest brother Sect was very ambitious and could do anything to become the heir to the throne, and he was getting support from the Western Empire. With the two brothers contending for power and getting more restless each day, the princess worries about her own safety and hopes that everything will go right on this trip. She jinxes herself as she says that, and her carriage is attacked by a bunch of assassins. Inside the carriage, the maid is keeping Yuriana safe, but then it abruptly stops and they realize that all the guards with them are dead and that they have been surrounded by the attackers. One of them opens the door, and the maid tries to protect the princess by leaping at the attacker with a dagger, but he slashes her and ends her life. Yuriana panics, and as she rushes to check on her close maid, the attacker stabs her through the heart, and it is game over for her too. One of the soldiers escorting her was also involved in the conspiracy to kill her, and he tells the assassins to loot the corpses and make it look like the work of bandits. As they laugh that they are going to get rich after this mission, Ponta jumps on the faces of the soldiers, and he wonders what the furious-looking creature was. He decides to just kill it to get rid of it, but the menacing Ark arrives behind him and grips his hands so tightly that the voice of his bones cracking is heard by everyone. Ark tosses the soldier aside and kneels down to see the injured girl, whom he thinks looks like the daughter of a rich family. The attackers think that he must have seen them kill the princess, and they attack him with fire and stone bullets, but he does not even feel their attacks. He just wonders if he should help the girl who was dead by using his insane skills to revive her. If it were just a game, it would be considered a good deed, and he would be rewarded in some way, but he is not so sure about bringing a dead person to life in reality. Ark notices the attacks only after they have stopped, and he turns around to see the attackers screaming as haunted wolves pounce on them. The boss of the wolves has come for his revenge on the humans and to thank Ark for saving him from insanity earlier, and he decides to join the wolves to get rid of the human trash as soon as possible. Some assassins succeed in running away, but the rest are killed, and the wolf boss leaves with his pack after completing its mission. Now that no one is around to see him, Ark decides it is safe to use his super high-level skill called Regeneration, using which he brings back the dead princess to life. Ark is glad that his skill works, and he tasks Ponta to watch over the girl as he helps the rest of the dead. He is able to heal the maid and some soldiers with the same skill, but one of them is so badly injured that the skill cannot do anything for him. Ark tries his best to save everyone he can, and as the bright light of the regeneration skill fills the area, the princess opens her eyes for a moment, wonders if the man standing in front of her was an angel, and then faints again. She wakes up later when the crying maid shakes her and explains that both of them were still alive without a single scratch. Some of the soldiers were dead, but the rest of them were somehow brought back to life by magic. The princess is certain that they were not just injured, and the blood on her damaged clothes is enough proof that she was killed, but a miracle sent by God saved them. She assembles her men and glows as she gives them a pep talk about how someone conspired to kill her, but by the mercy of God, a miracle saved them and she considers this the divine signal that they are destined to complete their mission. She pumps up the soldiers by saying that they will ride to their destination at once and nothing can stop them. Ark is watching this entire drama from the bushes, and he realizes that the girl was a princess. As he goes back, he wonders if he did too much by reviving her, and is certain that this could be a moment where history will change. He returns to Arian to find that she has completed her job and collected enough fur for her sister's veil. She asks him what happened, but he does not tell her much and says that it was nothing special. With that, they resume their journey and reach the capital city's marketplace when someone throws a man at Ark. He turns around to find that a kid is surrounded by many men, and as they attack him, she pokes one's eyes and taunts the others to come at her at once. Ark thinks that he should help the poor girl, but Arian says that there is no need for it. She is proven right as the young girl blasts the men away easily, and Ark is impressed. But then the girl looks at him, and he is a bit worried that she will pick a fight with him. Instead of that, she politely greets him and says that it was nice to meet him again, and Ark realizes that she was the beast girl ninja he met while rescuing the elves in Dinto. The girl tells Ark that he was excellent while saving the elves, and she wants to talk to him about something too. 
Arian asks him who the girl was and how she knew about their rescue operation, and Ark tells her that she was the one who actually gave him the information about the kidnapped elves' location in Dinto. The girl then introduces herself as Chiyom of the Jinchen clan, and says that she is one of the top six ninjas in her hidden village. For the rest of their conversation, the group books a room where Ark's inner weeb is coming out, as he thinks that a real furry ninja is the peak of fantasy. But then everyone introduces themselves formally, and Chiyom gets straight to the point, asking Ark why he called her a ninja when they first met. It is because he knows what ninjas are, but that would reveal him as coming from another world, and he does not say that. Instead, he replies that in his country, spies and assassins dress up like that, and they call them ninjas too. Chiyom thinks that Ark must come from the same country as their great founder, who came to this kingdom 600 years ago and is now a legend. Ark realizes that the founder of the ninjas was also from Japan, and he must have started a cult after getting ice skate into this world. But then Arian asks Chiyom what she wants to talk about with Ark, and the ninja girl gets gloomy as she says that she wants his help. Beastmen were facing the same problem as elves, humans were kidnapping and selling them as slaves. Chiyom and other ninjas were on a mission to save them, and they were planning something big for which they needed extra power. She is really desperate and says that she will offer them the information about the kidnapped elves as payment for helping her people, but Ark replies that he is already in a contract with the elves right now, and he needs their approval to take another job. Chiyom gets sad but Arian asks her if she was trained to save her people from a young age, and the ninja girl affirms, saying that this was her sole mission. Arian feels that both of them are the same, and in this feeling of solidarity, she agrees to help her because she knows the feeling of wanting to help her people. She asks Chiyom what their plan was, and she leads them to the site of action through a forest. Ark asks her if their founder was also a beastman, but Chiyom replies that he was a human from another country, and his name was Hanzo. He initially served as a spy for the Empire, but then he saw the injustices faced by the Beast People and helped them, taking some of them as his students and founding the Jinchen clan. Ark is shocked as he hears the name of the most famous ninja of all time, Hattori Hanzo, and now his doubts are confirmed that he was surely from Japan. He is jealous that someone was here before him, and not only did he leave his legacy as a ninja clan but also became a legend. Chiyom sees him acting strangely but Arian replies that he gets fits of fantasy disease sometimes. Then they come to another cliff from where they can see the largest slave market in the kingdom, which is like a well-guarded fortress, and their plan is to attack it and free the kidnapped people inside it. But Chiyom tells them that this place was the center of the slave trade, so if they attacked it, the reinforcements would come quickly, so they needed to be fast. She tells Ark and Arian to attack it swiftly and flashily, and then run away as fast as possible, because it could be dangerous for them otherwise. Chiyom says that not everyone who was participating in this mission, and not everyone they wanted to rescue will be able to escape, and Ark understands that she was planning to attack this place just as a distraction. The ninja girl confirms his guess and says that the beastmen ninjas had already positioned themselves in the city and were going to attack four other slave markets at the same time they were attacking here. The attention would be drawn to the biggest market and everyone in the other locations would have better chances of escaping. Arian says that this plan is too reckless, but Chiyom is already determined to sacrifice herself and many others if they can save the people in other places. She trusts that Ark and Arian will help her minimize casualties, but he says that they will fight with them to the end. Despite the ninja girl being reluctant to let him risk his life, Ark explains to her that he can use teleportation magic, and seeing her shocked, he says that she should have seen him use it back then. It is good news, and Chiyom thinks that at this rate, they may save everyone, so she decides to inform others. She tells them that they are going to attack the market tonight and tells them to prepare as she leads, hopping over the trees. Ark also thinks that they should prepare, and by preparation, he means eating. After that, he wants to do one more thing, and that is to wear a silly mask so that he stands out as a decoy. Arian is not a great fan of Halloween and says that this idea was just silly and neither she nor Ponta are impressed by Ark wearing the mask. As they are talking, Chiyom comes to see them along with another ninja, who is a mountain of muscle named Goman. Ark is shocked to hear that his name is the same as that of another famous ninja in Japan, and to confirm his doubts, he asks Chiyom about those being their real names, but learns that they were just titles given to the most skilled warriors. Ark has confirmed that both the ninjas were named after real legends of Japan, and he hopes to meet Naruto or Sasuke in their group too. 
Goman is an absent-minded and aggressive-looking man, and he stares at Ark before they suddenly engage in wrestling. The girls think they were fighting, but they do not know this is how men become friends, and the two men start laughing and complimenting each other's strength. Midnight comes, and it is time for them to carry out their plan. Arian and Chiom plan to sneak in from the back door, while Ark and Goman will attack openly from the front and draw all the attention to themselves. They split up to do their part, and the two bulky men approach the sleepy guards head-on, who recognize one of them as a beastman, but they are confused by the strange masked creature. They tell them to stop, but as Ark and Goman get close to them, they decide it's time to get flashy. The muscular ninja uses Earth-style ninjutsu to create rock spikes on his shoulder, which he uses to blow away the door with Ark's help. All the soldiers come running out to face them, and Ark punches them away like they are little dolls. Goman uses another jutsu and turns his body into steel, breaking the weapons of the soldiers attacking him. The soldiers are afraid of the two monsters and step back, and Ark takes this chance to one-up the ninja. He uses his skill, Rock Bullet, which is more like Rock Cannon, and crushes the soldiers using it. And for even more attention, he laughs like a maniac and terrorizes the already afraid soldiers. The ninja uses another ninjutsu called Rock Spear Strike, and he punches the ground, cracking it and making rock spikes come out of it. Ark is too competitive and wants to do better than him, so he uses his magic Rock Fang, and giant rock fangs come out of the ground. But then their earth magics combine and have a boosting effect on each other, and the spikes sprout up everywhere and destroy the entire area, and they get buried in the rubble of the mess they caused. Meanwhile, Arian, Ponta, and Chiyom have reached the back door, and as they see the show the two men are putting on, they rush to take advantage of the confusion. They run into a locked door, and with her lockpicking skills, the ninja girl opens it quickly, and they sneak into the fortress as the soldiers rush towards the front gate. Ponta notices some soldiers, and before they can do anything, Chiyom uses water ninjutsu and transforms her water attack into wolves that kill the soldiers. More soldiers come running towards them, and it is Arian's turn to deal with them now, which she does by burning them using her fire sword magic. They reach the basement, where the beastmen have been chained and kept in prisons. As Chiyom frees them, they ask her who she is, and as she declares that she is from the Jinshin clan, they suddenly become much more hopeful and energetic than before. She unlocks the prisons and tells the now free beastmen to help her while Arian keeps the incoming soldiers away. On the front gate, both Ark and Goman were buried in rubble, but they came out of it safely using their defense mechanisms. And as they think of assisting the girls, they have already completed their mission and come out to inform them that all the freed beastmen are standing guard in the hall. Now only the building in the back is left to be raided, and Goman volunteers to stay back as the rear guard to stop the soldiers, while the others go ahead, killing any guards in their way. They unlock doors, find an underground prison with more people, and free everyone. There is one cell that is particularly nasty smelling, and as Chiyom goes inside to find out what is in it, she sees a heap of her dead relatives. The other beastmen tell them that the injured and ill could not be sold and were left to die in such a pitiful condition. As everyone cries, Ark is furious too, but he decides to get the survivors out of this place before mourning the dead. All the people they freed gather together, and Ark teleports them out using Gate. After everyone is safely evacuated, Chiyom learns that the mission was successful in other locations too. Now Ark plans to go back to the fortress and finish the business once and for all. He teleports next to Goman, who is still holding his ground despite being severely injured. He says that they should wipe out the human filth together, and they use their combo moves of Rock Fang and Earth Spear to destroy the entire slave market. They set it on fire, and Arian and Chiyom are watching it from another cliff, but you may have guessed the cliff part by now. Then Ark teleports back to them with the dead bodies they could not carry back the first time, and Arian cremates them to give them a proper funeral. As the bodies burn, their spirits become free and fly to the sky, and Chiyomi swears to become even stronger so that no one else suffers like this. As their mission is completed and everyone has left, Ark and Goman strengthen their bond by wrestling again, while the girls talk about freeing their own people from oppression. The next day, they go boating in the capital, where the ninjas give them the promised information. Chion says that the people who bought the elves as slaves took them to the Holy Empire of the East. And as Arian hears the name of the Holy Empire, she gets into a serious mood. She informs Donka and others about the new information using a voicemail bird and then heads out to the Empire along with Ark. On the way to the Empire, they stop for a bit in the desert, 
where a huge flock of wyverns is covering the sky. Ark is overwhelmed by his fantasy fits, but Arian is confused because wyverns never travel in such large groups. Because of their large numbers, the voicemail bird is afraid to fly, and the message cannot be relayed to the other elves. Ark says that it is not a big problem, and he can just disperse the dragon like monsters. Without even explaining his plan, he jumps down from a cliff and makes a groundbreaking landing. Then he decides to use a mid-tier wide area attack called Lightning Damper, and dark clouds cover the sky and release lightning bolts that hit the wyverns. Arian and the others also get caught in the friendly fire, and when he teleports back to them after the sky has cleared, he is shocked to see them in such a pitiful condition. But as he tries to ask if they are all right, an elf with green hair and grass is taking notes about them. Ark and Arian go to an inn in the nearby town, and she is still angry that he used such a dangerous attack without even a warning. But then she moves on to the next thing and takes out a map of the Empire, looking for the shorter route to their destination. She only has an incomplete map without details, and the direct route is uncharted and risky. But there is something else that concerns Arian, and Ark asks her why she has been so worried ever since she heard the Empire's name. She replies that capturing elves and selling them was still legal in the Empire, and that is why she was in danger, and even being in a border town like this was risky for her. But then the green-haired elf from the morning approaches them, and he is quite fearless even as he shows his pointy ears in human territory. Before he can even say anything, Arian puts a pot over his head, telling him to hide the proof that he is not human. But the innkeeper and other people are quite friendly with him, and the elf girl is confused by what is happening. The elf introduces himself as a biologist named Carsi, who has lived in this town for 10 years and is friends with everyone. Arian still does not believe it, and Carsi gives her the Martin Luther King Jr. speech about how he wants humans and elves to happily coexist. She says that he was delusional, and he asks her if she was not traveling with a human despite hating them. After their debate is over, Ark asks Carsi why he approached him, and he says that he needed a certain monster specimen that was hard to catch. But seeing his powerful spell this morning, he was convinced that Ark and his partner could do it. Arian refuses, saying that they are busy with more important matters, but then Carsi offers a detailed map of the Empire as a reward. She is a bit tempted by the reward, so he throws in the bonus prize a copy of his research on magical creatures and Ark really wants that. He insists on Arian accepting his mission, and she allows him. Carsi is glad to get their help and tells them to meet him at the town gate in the morning. After that, Ark shows off his wealth and overpays for one room, and the innkeeper gives him a complimentary barrel of high-quality alcohol. In the room, as Arian thinks about humans and elves coexisting, he opens the barrel and pours her a glass, asking if she was even allowed to drink. The girl enters competitive mode and chugs down the glass in one gulp, and she likes it so much that her ears twitch without her noticing. Ark takes a sip and finds that it is not only very tasty, but also quite strong. It was so strong that Arian is hammered just with two glasses and jumps on Ark, giving him mixed signals about what she wants to do. He is confused if she wants him or the drink, and instead of giving him a clear answer, she violently shakes his head and slams him down all night. The next morning, she wakes in the tattered room with a hangover, and as she sees Ark on the floor without his armor, she thinks of him as just another skeleton and blasts him even as he tries to explain. Forgetting all that, they go to the counter, where the innkeeper teases them that she could hear banging sounds from their room all night. Arian is already too embarrassed here, but when they go to Carsi and apologize for making him wait, he replies that he understood they woke up late because of the intense last night. They drive off to find the monster with Carsi and one of his human friends, and Arian's hangover and motion sickness combine with the terrible smell coming from the goblin corpses the researcher was carrying. He says that the corpses were the bait to lure the sandworms that he wanted to study. Carsi's human friend gives Arian a special tea to help with a hangover, and even though she is still not comfortable with humans, she finds that it actually helped. Ark talks with Carsi and learns more about the sandworm they were supposed to capture. It was a seven to eight foot long creature that came out at night and fed mostly on dead creatures. It was weak to fire, and Carsi asks him not to use fire since he wants the specimen alive. Also, he adds that the sandworm had recently been found going towards the flock of wyverns, and as the two men are talking about monsters, Arian looks back and sees the cart with goblins, and the other person was missing. Just as she warns Ark, a giant sandworm appears from the ground, which is more like 70 feet, and Carsi says that he may have forgotten to add a zero. 
but he is also shocked upon seeing the giant worm and says that it was the biggest specimen he had ever seen. Carsey's human friend is lying on the ground with his wagon destroyed, and the sandworm notices him. As he goes in to attack him, Arian rushes to help and uses a fire blast on the monster. Despite fire being its weakness, the attack does nothing much to the sandworm, and it attacks her instead. It almost gets her, but Ark saves her while holding the giant sandworm with just one hand. He tells her to leave the rest of the task to him and begins wrestling with the worm then uses his immense strength to drag it out of the sand and slam it to the side. The sandworm dies, and only then does Ark notice that it also had that strange ring. The group drags the monster back to the town, and Carsey rewards the knight with the map and the book. Before leaving on their journey, Arian asks the biologist why he lives with humans, and he says that he likes them. Initially, he had a negative image of all humans when he lived in an elf village, but as he got to know them, he found they were not all bad and a peaceful future could be built where both races lived as friends. And there was wonderful news about a human noble and an elf girl falling in love and getting married. Arian is in disbelief and asks Ark what he thought, and he replies that there are different kinds of people among humans and elves. While it may not be possible for everyone to coexist, some of them might become good friends. They reach the town where the kidnapped elves were said to be held, but it is a military town with every place under tight security. They decide that they have to move slowly and carefully here, and decide to split to find more information. Ark finds that strange cries could be heard from the nearby fortress at night, and recently many people had gone missing from the city, but no one could say anything about the elves. He decides to go back to Arian, but then hears the voice of a woman being kidnapped by some men. As one of them tries to drag her along, Ark appears behind him and twists his hand. The other thugs rush to attack him, but with a flick of his fingers, he knocks them out. The girl is really grateful and runs to hug him, and Arian comes to find Ark at that exact moment. As she sees a strange girl hugging the knight, she is equally shocked and jealous. Even as Ark tells her that he found the girl in trouble and went out of his way to help her, she tells her to run home with an intense and scary stare. She is still jealous of the girl and acts quite cold as she tells Ark that she found out some helpful information. She takes him to another cliff from where they can see a fortress, and her sources tell her that the elves were brought here four months ago. Ark says a lot could have happened in those four months, but Arian is still hopeful to find someone alive, and they get closer to the building to check it out. They sneak into the fortress and find it strangely empty and quiet, and Arian finds a hidden door that hides stairs that lead to an underground storage area that smells of wild beasts. After using Ponta as a distraction to take out the guards at the gate, she tries to open it but can't because it is a sliding door and she is pushing it. There are a lot of prison cells in the location, and they are empty except for bones, fur, and bad smell. They find the next gate, and as Ark opens it, they find themselves in a massive underground cave supported by many pillars. An overconfident and arrogant monster tamer named Fumba was the one in charge of this place and he comes out on sensing the disturbance, and the moment he sees Arian, he stakes his claim on her. He says that she is his woman now and orders her to kill the knight. Ark is shocked when Arian really follows his orders and attacks him, and she does not stop even when he tries to shake her out of it. He asks Fumba what he did to his friend, and while he is busy talking, the elf girl picks him up and slams him into the ground using his favorite WWE move. At this point, he realizes that this was some type of bewitching curse and he uses the anti-curse spell on her, but it has no effect at all, and Arian keeps attacking him. Her consciousness has been hijacked, and she finds herself in front of her sister, who tells her that she is weak and needs to train hard. He tells her to fight in the dream, and Arian fights with Ark in real life. He keeps on cursing at her, but she keeps on attacking him without stopping. Ark realizes that his spell is working, but something is recasting the mind control spell on Arian almost immediately. He is certain that the monster tamer is not the one doing it himself, and as the elf girl strikes him, he sees a pair of eyes in the shadow behind her head. Ark asks Ponta to take care of it, and the pup jumps into Arian's hood and takes out an imp, a monster who could use powerful illusions. Ponta throws it out, Ark kills it using his flame spell, and Arian loses her consciousness. Fumba is impressed by Ark's knowledge and quick thinking so he introduces himself properly, saying that he is from a clan of monster tamers and the most skilled of them all. He left his village behind to create a name for himself in the world, and he could tame any and all monsters. 
Ark has no doubts about his claim as he sees the rings in his hand and realizes that he was the culprit behind Toadzilla, the wolves, and the giant sandworm. Fumba gets ready to fight and summons his guard, a giant white tiger, and tells Ark to be his dinner. But he is putting Arian to rest in a quiet corner, and before fighting, he has a question for the monster tamer. He asks him what happened to the kidnapped elves that were brought here four months ago, and Fumba laughs as he says that most of them were used up in the experiments of the Empire, and the ones that were left with him were fed to his beasts after he had enough fun with them. As he mocks their deaths, Ark gets furious, and with one slash, he is done with the giant tiger. He curses Fumba, saying that he saw all kinds of villains in his short journey and stayed calm despite seeing their evil acts. But the monster tamer was the worst one, and his actions had made Ark too furious to think of things rationally. Fumba laughs at him, taunting him that he was being too arrogant and would need to kill many more monsters before getting to him. He summons the rest of his pets using his whip, and they include all kinds of monsters that Ark has never seen. On Fumba's command, they attack Ark, but he slashes through all of them like he is playing Fruit Ninja in real life. Fumba keeps commanding the monsters to attack Ark from all sides, and he keeps on taking them down. But he forgets to pay attention to Orion's safety and panics when the monster tamer points him towards the giant ogre that was going to attack her. But before it can do anything, the ninja girl Chioma arrives at the scene and traps the monsters in a water prison. Fumba thinks that even if the knight has backup, it is no use because he has more monsters, but Chiyom tells him that he no longer has any monsters under his control. Gomen and other ninjas were in this base, and they had taken care of all the monsters. Ark asks her how she was here, and she tells him that she told Arian everything about this place, which she did not tell him because of jealousy. But their conversation is interrupted by a strong earthquake, and Fumba laughs, saying that his trump card woke him up because his dinner was late. He tells Ark that he will show him his masterpiece and that he will take care of them quickly. He runs out of the place, and Ark wants to chase him. But the falling boulders stop him from doing that, and Chion tells him that they should take Arian to safety first. Ark teleports outside, and from the air, he sees the side of the castle crack, and from the smoke and dust, he can spot a powerful monster coming out. It was the Hydra, the strongest water-type monster with the greatest mastery over the water element and a super powerful regeneration ability. Ark does not feel comfortable unless he is on a cliff. So he goes to one and notices that the Hydra has five rings, one for each of its five heads. Chiom says that the Hydra was called the nation-destroying monster, and she cannot believe a mere human could control it. She suggests that they retreat, but the Hydra notices them, and it uses a Hydro Blast attack at them that completely crushes the cliff they were standing on. Fumba is pleased to see that, and he thinks that his enemies are dead, and he laughs like a maniac, saying this was his true power. He wants to show it to his village elders, who told him that he was not strong and disciplined enough and did not acknowledge his talents. Anyone who has seen Star Wars knows that it is not a good thing to tell a proud genius. Fumba left the clan and met the Emperor of the Holy Empire, and he was employed by him to ruin their neighboring kingdom. Now, with the Hydra's power, he thinks that he is invincible, and he commands the giant monster to go ahead and feast on the people of the city. Ark and his group are buried under the rocks, but thanks to his shield, they survived, and he blows away the rocks. But then he looks around and does not find Arian and panics, only to turn back and find that she has entered dark mode. She is covered with a dark aura as she furiously tells him that she was not unconscious when the monster tamer was controlling her. So she heard everything he said about her and her people, and she wants to find him and fill him with pain and regret. Chiom agrees, saying that with the Hydra, Fumba was too big of a threat to be left alone. They both think that he must think they are dead, and thus it was the perfect chance to strike him down with a surprise attack. As they leave to find him, Ark does not move and says that they have to do something about the Hydra too. Chiom tells him that there is not much they can do because it is a monster that could wipe out countries and could be called a force of nature. Ark does not agree with the last line and says that unlike natural calamities, the Hydra can be killed, and even as the ninja girl asks him if he was joking, Arian tells him to go ahead and deal with the monster while they dealt with his tamer. Arian and Chiom run towards the monster tamer and surprise him with a firebolt attack, which he barely dodges. Arian says that she was here to kill him for the elves he tortured, and he replies that she was way too powerless against him. He says that he has the Hydra on his side, and the elf girl replies that the Hydra was indeed strong, but he was weak, and was making such a grand show of the Hydra to hide his own weakness. 
Those words are the same as what his village elders told him, and Fumba snaps. He says he will kill everyone and show them his power. But Arian attacks him without waiting for his boring dialogue to finish. He blocks her attack with his whip and tries to use the imps to control her again. But she cuts all of them down, saying she won't fall for the same trick twice. Fumba is frustrated now, and he tries to order the Hydra to help him when Chiom throws knives at him and cuts his back, ruining his tattoo. She says that she noticed earlier that he was controlling the monsters using his complex cursed markings, but the slightest disruption could make them useless, and now he could no longer control anything. Fumba is on his edge now, and he laughs like a maniac, telling the girls not to blame him for what the Hydra does next. Chiom is worried about the city, but Arian tells her that as long as Ark was there, he would not let the monster kill anyone. Then she charges her sword with fire and walks towards the scared monster tamer, who tries to stop her with his whip, but it burns down easily, and he apologizes for harming the elves. Arian tells him that she does not need his apology, he could give it to the ones he killed when he met them. With that cool dialogue, she uses her most powerful spell and burns Fumba in blue flames till not even his ashes are left. On the other side, the Hydra walks through the forest, crushing trees like they were grass, and it aims its Hydro Blast at the city when Ark stops using his Wyvern Slash attack. But it had no effect on the Hydra, which turned all its heads towards him. It tries to bite him with tremendous force, but Ark dodges the attacks and then uses his skill Shield Bash to disbalance it and the Hydra heads swing back one after the other. Then he teleports himself up in the air and attacks one of its necks with a WW move, and despite that attack, the monster is pretty much unharmed. It attacks Ark with three Hydra Blasts, and he dodges the giant explosion with his Dimension Walk skill, only to get bitten by one head. And then, three other heads charge a Hydro Blast, and Ark realizes they were sacrificing one head to kill him for sure. But that is quite useless, as his shield protects him from any damage, but the monster loses one head. Ark gets down and then uses the ultimate skill Judgment with full power and summons a giant lightning sword from the sky that chops off three of the Hydra's heads. With just one head remaining, the monster begins to regenerate the ones he lost using a weird bubblegum-like foam, and Ark thinks this could be expected from a mythical beast, so to give himself some distance in order to prepare his finishing move. Ark teleports to another cliff and decides to use a grand magic that he had never tried before. It was going to be too powerful and exhausting, and he could only use it for a short duration, but that should be enough to take down the Hydra. Ark creates a giant magic circle, and with all his power, he summons the infernal demon, Ifrit. As the giant fire demon comes out, the Hydra has completely healed and finds itself facing an opponent of the same size. They rush towards each other, and the demon snaps the monster's heads with its bare fists and crushes its jaw when it tries to use the Hydro Blast. He punches and bites the Hydra, who starts to run away after being free of Fumba's control and realizing it was outmatched. But Ark jumps on it from the sky and swings it around by the tail with all his strength before throwing it high into the sky. Then he commands Ifrit to use its ultimate skill, Flame Hellion, and with a bright pillar of fire that could be seen halfway across the globe. The Hydra burns down into nothing. Arian and Chiom are shocked upon seeing the fight between two giant monsters, and as the sun rises, Ark returns to them and says he is glad that they are safe. They ask him about the giant fire demon, and he tells them that it was a being summoned from another dimension and would go home in five minutes. Soon, Arian receives a voicemail from Danka, delivering a shocking yet good news. The Princess Yuriana of the Roden Kingdom had met with one of the Elders of Elves, and she said that their kingdom took responsibility for the humans breaking the peace treaty and kidnapping elves. She had promised to search for the missing elves, but there was another thing she got the elder to agree to. She explained to the elder that her two elder brothers who tried to assassinate her were supported by the Eastern and Western empires, both of which were racist countries, and to prevent any of them from becoming kings and worsening relations between humans and elves, she wants to be the queen. She promised the Elf Elder that if he supports her in her claim for the throne, she will fight alongside them in case the Holy Empire invades them. The Elder gladly took the deal, and the Princess told him that they should work together to build a world where humans and Elves coexist peacefully. Despite such immensely positive news, Arian is displeased and goes through a crisis as her sole purpose in life is taken away now that the humans are going to look for the kidnapped Elves. She is surprised that humans could even treat elves like this, and she remembers what Carsey told her. 
and Ark said that maybe the time of peaceful coexistence was going to come sooner than they imagined. Arian replies that ever since she met Ark, it seemed like the world was changing around him, and he just laughs that off. He says that now that the big mission is over, he will go back to living a quiet life, and neither of the girls believe him. In a joke, he takes off his helmet, and the poor Chiyom, who did not even get a warning, is terrified, hides behind a tree, and does not come out even as Arian explains the whole curse scenario. Then, she tells Ark to come to her home, and after a brief rest, they would head together to the Lord's crown, where he could break his curse, and he thinks that would be best. So, the journey Ark took to lead a quiet life turned out like this, and with his many friends, he hopes it continues to be as fun as it has been. He still has no idea why he was sent to this world, but he doesn't even care as long as he gets to enjoy his skeleton life while he is here.